Very good evening. Thank you for taking your time out joining us. Um, yeah, how's it going on your side? Good evening, Ivan. No, really good. It's really cold in the free state, but uh, all good, yeah. You say it's cold in the free state, but I can assure you you're wearing shorts, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's just something on people in Bloom. They'll say it's cold, <laughs> but they were the cold bookies on. Uh, Yaku, you know, let's talk about the bunker system at the moment. I mean, at times we, we always question the TMO communicating with the ref. I'm the guy at home. I get a bit frustrated. It's taking too long. Oh, it was not a red card. It should have been a yellow. How does this help the game with, with the introduction of the bunker system? Yeah, the bunker was brought in for mainly to save time. Um, the referee gets two looks, um, two replays, and then if it meets the threshold of a yellow card, then it goes on report with a signal just like league, and then it goes to an off, off-site bunker. Um, it also kills the perception of local broadcast that's showing the replays, because the moment it goes over to the bunker, that is controlled by Hawkeye. You know, the same guys that uh, do cricket reviews and, and, and Wimbledon, you see the Hawkeye tennis reviews. Those people take over the production and uh, they... The offside bunker will have two or three officials in, and they will then uh, return to the television match official at the stadium uh, with a decision. That obviously has to happen within eight minutes before the yellow card expires. So there's an eight-minute time cap on that, and the teams play ahead. And then once that eight minutes reach, um, the, the TMO, uh, the bunker com- confirms with the TMO, it remains a yellow card for uh, a reason where it's a red card with mitigation, or it's a yellow card just at that level of danger, or they state. It's upgraded, and for what reason? And then at the next appropriate break, the red people just uh, pull both captains, confirm the new decision, uh, confirm it's yellow, or upgrade for the red. Um, the fact that the referee hasn't made the decision is also perhaps better for the referees to be seen as not compromised in the next 40 or 60 minutes of the rest of the game, having to play a balanced game because they've made a decision uh, that impacts the game or not. So I think that's all of that uh, in the pot, I think, is a really good positive. Um, and we're trying to learn as quickly as we can to track the chance of that. So talk to me about the people in the bunker. Uh, is it ex-TMO, ex-players, ex-ref, current refs, best in the system? How do they select that? Because now, from a viewer point of view, we've got to be know that whoever's making that call that we can't really see is qualified to make that call. Yeah, at the moment, it's, it's, it's TMOs, um, current TMOs. And at, at times, I will be in the bunker myself um, as the second or third official. So there'll be a mix of Current TMOs, who's used to the technology and working through the system, have been backed up by some of the officials that you see in, in the rugby champs and at the World Cup. Um, so that there'll be a mix of TMOs, uh, practicing referees and assistant referees that, that fill that gap. Um, yeah, okay, Nick here. Um, if, if it's, if it's um, escalated to a red, um, will, will you have a chance? Uh, do you cho- speak to both captains and will... Uh, there be a, t- a chance for that to be played, you know, over television, so that it can be explained to the public out there, so they can actually have a clear understanding of why that player I- has been uh, given a, a red. Yes, Nick. Um, once the bunker confirms the decision, they also confirm the camera angle, so the, the, the host broadcaster will then, once the referee stops the game, you don't stop the game. The next natural break in the game, yes, um, the referee will call the captains. That will be fired up on the big street so, so the captains can see that, the star, uh, people at home can see that, and that's the, the angle that the decision was made on. Perfect. Obviously, there's no argument because yeah. uh, that's final. <clears throat> no, that's right. Perfect. All right, so a good one just to make sure that uh, the, the, the ref, everybody involved, makes the right decision in terms of red, yellow, keep as many players onto the park as possible. The next one, uh, diving onto, on, onto the ball. Um, what are the options for a player uh, in terms of diving on that ball that's emerging out of a ruck? There it is, diving players, emerging ball. Uh, you can only dive anything uh, one meter is illegal. Within one meter is illegal. So, so what should happen? Should you be able to pick it up or are you allowed to kick it? What is he? Um, so... Can you explain, Yaka, what, what, what is, uh, the, re- what is the, the law? So, a ball that emerges from a ruck, when it's deemed to be emerging from a ruck when it's still within that meter. Um, so, we're expecting players, and the law expects players to, uh, you can collect the ball with your hands, or you can kick at the ball. That's different to when the ball is actually in the ruck, then you cannot kick the ball, because that's for safety reasons being heads and, and knees and, and, you know, people around that ball. Once the ball's outside the ruck, you can kick at it um, and, and you can pick it up. And then you can go to the ball. But we just don't want the players to actually dive on that ball, create a new uh, pile of bodies on the ground, and that leads to slower play. Um, 
you know, a, a yeah. caterpillar rut and that sort of thing, and, and most likely lead to a penalty for holding on. Yeah. So that's an attempt to just uh, clean up the edges of the ruck and and get the game. Nice. So, so, so you, you're agreeing that if the ball squirts out the ruck and a player or the ref feels this and it's about two metres, three metres, a player can dive on it, correct? Correct. So what we've done with the box is we've, we've just made the judgment where when you can see that ball is clearly exposed away from the ruck, it's rolling, then you can dive. When the ball just sits there, don't dive on it. But if the ball's in motion away from the ruck, obviously you can dive. All right, so that ball's got to be out as well for the guy to kick it through or, or try to pick it up. Um, comment from your side with, with that? Feels that, I mean, Yaku saying could speed up play. Uh, your, your take as a coach? Could definitely feel the difference in, in the URC. Um, that was implemented with us as well, Yaku would know. Uh, like Yaku said, just, just clears up the right area, gives you a bit of space. Um, people can see just diving on it, like Yaku say, forming a second rack or forming a third rack. Uh, it must change for us. All right, just speeds up the play. And then dangerous clean outs. Y- Yaku, just explain that as well because the viewers at home sit. I mean, it happened. Uh, it happens every game. Be it Craven, whatever you watch, you, you always pick it up and there's a big debate. Well, what, what's, what's, uh, what's being highlighted and taken care of in the dangerous clean outs? And there it is. Yeah, uh, dangerous clean outs, really yeah. This is really good for the Springboks um, because we've got loads of players that jackal and, and have to compete for the position on the pool. Um, and sometimes when you. When the jackal beats the clean out to, the, to that position, the only way you can take him out is by actually hurting him or you know, causing some uh, dangerous situation. So the first one is where a player drops his weight on top of that player and then it drops on the lower limb. That's that's caused long-term injuries. A lot of players have had 9 to 12-month injuries because of spiked knees and, 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 and legs that get caught in that position. So that's the first one. And then the second one is the inversion. We have players over the top of the ball. Um, you often see it with players that can go low, like Marco von Staden and uh, let's say Dion Fury and Malcolm Marks. They, the only way to move them is to actually lift the leg and to tip them. It's kind of similar to a tip, tip tackle. And that inversion on the neck and shoulders can also cause long term injuries. So this is driven by the coaches, players. They want us to deal with this to, to protect their players. No, that's like. You know, I, I would agree entirely with that. It, it, it falls under the safety too for the, you know, all the, the world rugby is so concerned about concussions and about breakages that uh, that makes perfect sense. You can do a lot of damage at a breakdown in tipping someone up or else, as you say, going in hard with a shoulder onto a knee, an exposed knee, uh, you can do a tremendous amount of damage there, you know, pretending that it's a clean out. So that's great for the security and the safety of the game. Cash, let's talk about it. You, you're currently coaching. There's a situation. Dion furry has gone over the ball. How do you clean him out? How do you coach your players to clean him out? Because now it's a new season. You've experienced it in URC, but it's implemented world rugby. We're saying can't take him over. Guy's sitting at home now. You know, he, he hits a lot of racks. Well, how, do you, how do you sort it out? Well, obviously, it, it makes the, the race of the racks so much more important. So I, I, I need to, to beat Nick to you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, if not, it becomes a shoulder hard battle. So then it's a, then it's a, if he's stapled over the ball, me getting underneath him, trying to move him. Um, like I said, you can't go from the side and dive on, dive on the legs. Um, I can, I can, there's numerous catastrophic injuries from so there. So at the moment you're saying to me, me being beaten to the ruck, my job is to work hard to get underneath the guy yeah. who got there before me and move it. Yes, you won't, you won't do it. You won't manage against uh, Marco van Staden or, yeah, or, or, or Malcolm Marx or, or Fury. You won't yeah. get him off. Once he's beaten you there, you've lost that ball. So, so, so what, so, what so, it works... Hang on, Nick. Hang on. This, I, no, hang on, I just want to finish mine because... What, no, but what, I started this. I'm trying to take it somewhere here. you saying at the moment, you as a Lions, you're, you're attacking, defending. Guys have gone in. You leave it alone. They can have the ball. Is that what coaches are saying now? Marco's gotten there. He's there first. Leave him alone. Let them play. Is that the way forward? We're not even going to. We're not even willing to compete anymore. No, be, we'll, we'll compete there definitely. Ah, that's what I'm trying to say. Because remember now, we, we've gone. If you take him over, it's a penalty. That impacts on coaching. Yeah. So there, there's a there's a, a small window there of an angle Thank where you, where, where you can you. approach him, um, head on like that. I mean, you won't, you're not going to move Malcolm, like, I said, mm. like Nick said. No. So there, there is a there is an angle, um, but heart is heart is important. With after the hit, a continuous leg drive. But if it's, and I'll be honest, if it's a clearly lost ball, because we need you in the defensive line way more than just trying to slow that down and, and put extra numbers in the ruck. The most effective, the most effective way uh, to stop a Dion Fury or a Marx is to play like Ireland play, where they Im- have two immediate cleaners on every ball carrier. 
So all their, their pods, their little squares that come round a corner, whoever takes it in, he's got two players no more than a meter away from him as he goes into contact. So when you watch Dion Ferri play in the URC, the only teams that he didn't get steals from were Leinster, were Munster, because the Irish teams play a pattern where the ball carrier is supported immediately by two cleaners. If you play a, a lateral game where you, uh, you know, you are two passes and you're hitting a hard runner, that hard runner can get exposed, and that's where Dion Free comes into the game. And once he's over the ball, as I was saying, it'll, it'll be illegal. Whatever you do to him is going to be illegal. So you should be saying to your players, leave him alone, rather lose the ball, don't give a penalty away, and don't give a risk of getting a yellow card, because it sounds like you could get a yellow card from a dangerous clean out. All right. Yaku, uh, Dan and Blum, are you still there? Jakes? Yeah. All right. Once again, a great debate. We're seeing it differently. We will learn as we go along. All the best for the Rugby World Cup. And thank you for joining us. I'm sure we'll chat to you before you jet off or somewhere along the line. Just give us more insights in terms of what's happening in the referee world. Can I ask a question? Sure. Can I? Uh, yeah, Coach. Um, no, we don't have time on the show, but you Yeah, just a, just a quick one with, with regard to the, to the referees uh, going to the World Cup. How many are, are, are new to the World Cup and how many have had experience of being there before? Um, nine of the referees have been to the World Cup. Um, uh, seven of those as referees. Two of those as assistant referees at the previous World Cup. And then we uh, uh, all new squad of assistant referees because they're breeding the next generation to the thing. Um, and then the TMOs, five out of the seven, has been to the World Cup. Okay. Okay. All right, Jake. Uh, yeah, once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for some insights.